Hello everyone, um, Alex back again for another go at this live session. I, I've decided to come back and have another go pretty quickly, having messed up the sound on the last one. So I'll start with a plea. If I if I go wrong technically, please get on the messages and, and let me know because I'm the last to know if it's not coming through properly. And that way hopefully I can do something about it while you're watching. I guess the biggest excitement here is I actually went scuba diving. I remembered how to do it. I remembered how the underwater camera worked. And so that's a, a big sort of thing that's happened to me this week. I did one scuba dive, which is very exciting. And as a result, that's going to drive what I want to talk about today. Um, that dive, we dived, I went diving with my friend Atanas on the north coast of Norfolk in England, which is not a classic scuba diving destination. And we were greeted by phenomenal three meter visibility. So that means I could see the end of my fins, but not a great deal further than that. And after the dive, Atanas and I were having a good chat um, about the pictures we got. And Atanas was asking me a lot about the techniques I was using to um, defeat and, or to get relatively clean images in those conditions. And we had a good chat about backscatter. And I thought that'd be a fun thing to talk about today. So today we're going to get into the subject of backscatter. I think the first thing I would say about backscatter as a photographer is don't get too obsessive about it. The one thing that I think all these techniques can do is make you so worried about avoiding and eliminating backscatter from your pictures that you don't care about anything else. And I think the analogy that I use in my book is something along the lines of it's like writing a cookbook and telling people that the only thing you're going to focus on is not burning the food. And there's a lot more to cooking than that. And there's a lot more to creating beautiful underwater pictures than simply avoiding backscatter. But hopefully with the solutions that we run through today, it can help you minimise backscatter, particularly in challenging low visibility conditions. That said, most of these solutions do bring compromises. And I think that's something really important to bear in mind throughout is that when the conditions allow you not to have to use these techniques, don't limit yourself to them. So it's not necessarily the elimination of backscatter isn't really a best practice for all your underwater photography, but it can really help you in low visibility environments. As before, I want to do a talk for about 10, 15 minutes and then about 10, 15 minutes of questions afterwards. So please give me some comments and particularly ask me some questions on underwater photography and I'll have a go at answering those live after I've gone through the talk. And just a reminder, any technical problems, hopefully you can hear me and not hear me twice, which was my big issue last time. I'm planning not to make the same mistakes again but I might have some whole new ones to, to show, show you, but maybe not. Right, so if I press this, should get me my slideshow, right? And the, this is when the sound went wrong last time and there's a big sign just came up saying MacBook Pro microphone muted, which sounds good to me. Okay, so there's not one cure for backscatter and I'm going to illustrate this talk today primarily with pictures I took while diving this week. I wasn't on the dive trying to take pictures to show you how to get rid of backscatter. I was very much just trying to take pictures that would work in very challenging conditions. And I, because I was using certain you know, one lens and the kit I went down with, I didn't have every trick in the book. So I'm going to start off by showing you some of the things I didn't do, which I might have done in other situations, particularly if I was shooting wide angle, I was shooting with a macro lens. And then I'll run through some of the things I did try during the dive. I didn't take any before and after pictures simply because I wasn't planning to use this as a teaching thing. I was simply just enjoying taking some underwater photos again. Okay, next slide. So just quickly, what is backscatter for anyone who's relatively new to underwater photography? I think most watching this know exactly what it is and are very familiar with backscatter. But backscatter is when crud in the water is illuminated by our flash guns um, and as a result creates either bright specks when it's in focus or big splodgy blobs is when it's out of focus in our picture. And generally it doesn't look too great in our pictures. We want our subjects to stand out. And this is a picture I took this week, as the previous one was as well. And both of them are pretty much hammered to bits by backscatter and are going to go in the trash. Um, the photos I'm going to show from this week in the talk, they're all, um, they all come out of Lightroom. So I've tweaked the levels, but I've not removed any specs from them. So you can see the pictures as, as I took them. OK, so just some of the solutions for getting rid of backscatter in our pictures. I think... Perhaps the most important message to, to start off with 
is it's really important when you're planning diving in, in traditionally low vis environments to seek out the best visibility conditions. Pay attention to other people who are diving there and try and time your dives to the bright water conditions in terms of waves and tide that might give you better visibility. Listen to people reporting, oh, the weather's been good recently, the sea conditions have been calm, we've got really good visibility at the moment, or we've got a big plankton bloom or whatever it might be that might lower visibility. And try and time and plan your diving accordingly. I think also then once you're in the water, diving really well is, is really critical. And people who are good divers and a lot of the, the lower visibility diving might be might temperate water diving when you might be wearing dry suits and different equipment. Being a really good diver wearing that equipment can really make a massive difference to you maintaining the good water quality and the good clear water to take pictures in, particularly when you're maneuvering near the seabed. So being a really good diver is absolutely important. Um, and then I think the final thing which I always take into the dives is to shoot to the conditions you've got. So, and that kind of works both ways. So when it's very low visibility, be appreciative of what you can't do. And when the visibility is good, be appreciative of what you can do. At the same time, as I said in that introduction, I know people are tuning in all the time, don't make the elimination of backscatter the only thing you're thinking about when it comes to your lighting, because most of the techniques for eliminating backscatter determine the quality of light, the type of lighting that we're producing, the type of look of images that we're producing, um, the styles of shots and things like that. And as a result, you'll limit your portfolio creatively if you always just make eliminating backscatter the highlight. And ultimately, don't worry about getting every last speck out of every picture. For me, it's always about, you know, the sea's got particles in, fresh water's got even more in. So it's not about getting rid of every last speck, um, but you don't want that backscatter to be really stopping the viewer enjoying the picture. The most important thing in my mind when thinking about the solutions that get rid of backscatter is to remember that it's not a problem of angles, it's a problem of volumes. And those volumes that I'm talking about and those angles that I'm talking about are the relationship between the where the lens is looking and where the strobes are lighting. And a lot of the time as underwater photographers, we tend to talk about these volume, these the angles of the strobes. Oh, what angles did you have your strobes? What positions did you have your strobes to get rid of backscatter? The thing to remember when trying to figure out the best way to defeat backscatter is that this is a three-dimensional problem. It's not just about those angles like that. It's really about those volumes. And the best way to reduce the amount of water that both your lens is looking through and your strobes are lighting up, which is where the backscatter comes, is to get close to your subject. And there's no better solution to get rid of backscatter in your pictures than to get close to the subject. And that therefore reduces the volume massively that the lens is looking through and the strobes are, uh, are shining through. And that massively reduces your backscatter. So for me, when I'm diving in relatively low visibility water, these pictures are both taken in the UK, um, not this week, but, um, but both on, oh no, one is West Coast, one is East Coast, um, is that I will choose techniques that I know will work in those conditions. And typically when the visibility is low, you can still shoot plenty of wide angle, but you have to limit your wide angle to close focus wide angle, almost the closer the better. That means actually, and it's sort of almost slightly counterintuitive this, that when, I, when I'm going diving in lower visibility water to shoot wide angle, I typically dive with very short strobe arms because my intention is to give you very close to the subject and therefore there's no need for great long strobe arms. So I tend to dive with a much more compact rig when I'm diving in, in low visibility conditions. And actually I save those big long strobe arms for when I head out into the blue water. So an important thing to remember when working with backscatter is we are limited by the types of shots that we can take when we shoot in low visibility conditions. So therefore, when you get those really fantastic conditions, and these are both tropical shots, that's when you can really go for these really big scenes where you're shooting a really big scene and trying to light it all up with your flash guns. And pictures like this would of course be, you know, impossible in really low visibility. But when the conditions allow, definitely try and get these pictures into your portfolio. Tell these grand stories of the ocean that you can really tell when the visibility allows you. And this is part of being a good photographer in terms of dealing with, with backscatter. I think another thing that can really help us when we know we're going on a low visibility dive, which is gonna cause this problems with backscatter, is choosing the right lenses. And generally the key is to choose lenses that are gonna force you to get that little bit closer to the subject. So for example, super macro is actually a really good thing to do in low visibility diving because it forces you to be really close. The volume of water you're working with is very low. And as a result, backscatter is generally not a problem because you're really, really close to the subject working over you know, camera subjects like this, and it's really not a problem. 
Another thing I like to do is to go one lens wider than you might normally do. So say, for example, you, you like shooting in nudib nudibranchs. Typically, as a full frame Nikon shooter, I would use a 105 mil macro lens for them. But in low visibility conditions, I might choose to do those shots with the 60 mil. The same with with the um, the lump fish, the lump sucker on the on the left on the on the left there. Um, that's a subject that maybe you would normally use maybe a 60 mil for, and instead I've gone to a wide angle lens to force myself to get really really close, and as a result get a nice clean image as a result. So, you know, if you've got a target species in mind, it can really help to go to that that slightly wider lens. Another thing that can really help us hide backscatter is to go with a very limited depth of field. And this is quite a good technique if you're on a dive and maybe it's very silty, silty than you were expecting, is actually to play around with a different technique. And low depth of field shooting is a great way of hiding backscatter. You will still pick up the particles very clearly that are in that, that limit, that thin strip of focus. And you'll have to clean those in post-processing if it's very, it's very, very murky. But most of the stuff before and behind the subject will be so blurred out, it won't really show up in the picture. So it's a good solution um, kind of work in a similar way to super macro, but without the really close focus working distance. Okay, the rest of the pictures are, are pictures I took this week, and they're just and all these pictures are have not had any particles removed. And for those that weren't here at the beginning of this chat, um, just to remind you, the visibility was about three meters, so I could see my fins, but only just, and I could see a little bit past the fins. It was quite high particulate, but it wasn't super snotty or anything like that. It was all quite just, just fine sediment quite easy to work with. And the first solution that I go to when the conditions are like that is to shoot predominantly with single strobe. Now I was diving with two strobes. Um, maybe I can even, I've got my camera here, so maybe I can show you, pull it up into the, you can see me in the corner of the frame. This is the camera rig I was shooting with. Maybe I should go back to full frame for this one a sec. This is the camera rig I was shooting with um, this week. And although I had two strobes on it, I was very much shooting with single strobe. And most of the time using one strobe to, to light the subject. The other things that I was adding to my strobe is I have beam restrictors on them. These are the ones, these are commercial ones designed by, by Retra, uh, or actually designed by me for, for Retra, but um, which is what I guess why I was using them. Um, but you know, it doesn't matter. You can use a, an old flower pot. You can use some you know plastic PVC pipe or something like that. It works very well. So I've got a beam restrictor on, and then I've got an insert. This is just an insert that goes in that beam, in, in that beam restrictor. And all that does is it stops me spraying light everywhere. So, you know, going to one strobe halves your backscatter in one go. Then adding beam restrictors just narrows that beam down. So you're, again, reducing that volume of, of area of particles that the strobes are lighting and the lens is trying to look through. And then playing around with strobe position is, is, of course, really, really important. And if I go back to my picture, you'll see a lot of these are shot with, with very hard lighting angles. These pictures here are predominantly top lip shots um, with the strobe pushed out in front of my camera and coming down on top of the subject. I'm working very close to the subject. I was using a 60 mil lens, which is quite a wide lens on a, on a, as a macro lens on a full frame camera, trying to be as close as possible and then having the strobe lighting the subject. And once you've got this lighting right, you can produce shots, relatively clean shots again and again and again. So these shots, you know, straight out of Lightroom, no, no cleaning yet. There is scatter in them. And I, I processed a couple of these today properly. And yeah, I have to go through and clean a bit of backscatter up, particularly around the body of the animal. But the majority of the frame is nice and clean um, straight out of the camera. And this is, again, using that beam restrictor things um, approach. So single strobe, going down to single strobe, trying not to light anything more than I need to. And as a result, getting a relatively clean picture straight out of the camera. So other techniques, you know, which, which aren't really photographic techniques, it's just about thinking what's going to work in those conditions, is if you completely fill the frame with subject matter and you're nice and close to that subject matter, these are plumos and enemies just growing on, on, the, on the, the dive site that we were diving on, filling the frame with subject, the bat scatter is still there, but you don't really see it with all this great colour and detail to look at. If you actually look into the corners of this picture, I think my... My head is actually in, in covering a lot of the bat scatter. That's a good trick. But if you look up into the corners of the frame, you can see um, there is bat scatter, and you can look in the gaps between them. There is bat scatter, but it's not obtrusive. And if you want to clean that up in post, great. You've only got a small bit to clean up. Backgrounds can really help us um, hide bat scatter, and I think one of the things that's always going to show bat scatter up really strongly is a black background. You know, if your backscatter is typically white specs, white specs are going to show up most on a black background. So if we can get away from that black background, 
great. And so one technique is, is to, instead of going for a black background, is to allow the ambient light to come in the background. And the backscatter is still there, but it doesn't show up as much against a blue background. So here, I, or in this case, a green background, I've slowed the shutter speed down, allowed the ambient light to come into the picture. And um, I've actually gone for quite a bright blue or bluey green background here, because the brighter that is, the more it's going to hide those white backscatter specs. And then in post, I'll just go through and clean these anyway. But I don't have to clean every last one. I'll just clean the big obtrusive ones. And uh, the last couple of slides are edible crabs, not really the nicest, nicest name for them. They often call them brown crabs. And, and actually in the, in the, off the east coast of England, they're known as chroma crabs. Chroma is a famous fishing port and the crabs are especially delicious. Apparently, I, I don't eat seafood, as many of you know. But um, so these are chroma crabs. We'll call them that rather than edible crabs. And um, this is a kind of typical behavior when males often sort of guard females. It may not be guarding, um, but they guard them pre to them molting so they can mate with them when they molt. Um, it may just be two sharing a hole here. But anyway, here, because I was shooting into the, the, the reef, I've gone in as close as I can. I think ideally in clear waters, I'd like a little bit more space around the subjects. But again, if I can just go a little bit closer, it's going to minimize my backscatter. Now, there is backscatter in all the shadowy areas of this picture, but it's a relatively small amount of the frame to clean up in post. I'm not going to worry too much about that when I'm shooting it. I'd rather just get a nice, strong composition. It's another, another angle on the same pair. Looking down on them, I quite like this. The, the female looks a lot smaller here, which uh, the, the male's on top and the female's underneath. I think that works quite well in the composition. Again, there is scatter in all those shadowy areas, but there isn't really too much here. So for me, I think that works well. That shooting into the reef, shooting into the seabed, um, into the structure, hides a lot of the backscatter. Right, so I think that was the last slide. So, and I've done 15 minutes, so let me just try to get myself back. Right, so thank you for all the messages. Um, I shall endeavor to answer some questions. This is gonna test my skills, right? How do I get these up again? Hey Brooke, nice to see you. Um, Goose skiving off again. Please thank you for the messages that my, my audio is and, and video is working today. Mm. You probably shouldn't read that one out, Tony, in case someone, someone of your employees is listening. Afternoon, Shane. Okay, question from, from Tony. While photographing wide, will banging the ISO help backscatter? Generally, it's, it's not going to help backscatter in terms of just the settings. But actually, as I was saying with that example of the, the short side spine scorpion fish, the, the, the fish basically in, in those pictures at the end, um, the bright background there really helped hide the backscatter. So working at a higher ISO, having a nice bright watercolor can really help hide backscatter and higher ISO would help with that. But in terms of the, the physics of everything else, not, not so much. Um, hi, Todd. Nice to see you. Thanks for, for joining and greetings. Hi, Peter. Good to see you. Hope all is well down there in South Africa. Um, right, I'm gonna, gonna skip through some of these. Um, hi, Frankie. Right, nice. everyone's saying welcome. Um, right, Paul Colley's got a, actually a really good comment and suggestion here. He says, I'm doing more work on rivers with remote cameras, um, firing one speed light above the water, struggling with refraction. Any ideas how to control the beams? Um, first of all, I would say that actually in very shallow water, this can be quite a good anti backscatter technique. Um, it works really well, actually. Let me find a picture where I've shot the um, sockeye. Uh, that's one of the, so, so this shot here, for example. Oh, um, you guys probably aren't seeing that. Wait a second. Let me just share my screen. Um, uh, I knew I'd have some sort of technical issue at some point. Right, screen share. And... Um, now I just uh, what I would like to do is share bridge. There we go. You should be seeing bridge, right? And then these are my sockeye salmon. And this shot here, the strobes were out of the water, firing down into the water. And that in murky water is actually quite a nice way of of avoiding backscatter. You're still going to get some backscatter, but you haven't got the strobes going from next to the camera onto the subject. I know that's not what Paul's question was, but it, it was an interesting point that wasn't in my backscatter talk. Right. So let's go back to my camera. Right. So, um. Struggling with refraction. So do you mean by that, Paul, that you're getting not enough penetration of light from your above water strobe into the water or you're getting beams of sunlight from the from the strobe? It's, by the sounds of it, it sounds like beams of light. Ultimately, I would think the angle is going to be a big thing and you'll get less obtrusive beams if you can really get the strobe up and above and top lighting. 
the subject, I think. But I think generally those beams can look really attractive in the picture. I did a shot of a manatee years ago where I had the strobe out of the water and love the, the kind of refracted, ripply effect that the strobe coming down through the, the water um, made, made on the subject. Um, I don't think I've answered your question very well, Paul, so we might have to chat about that another time. Um, when is your viz less than a meter? Are you limited to low depth of field and super macro shots? Ultimately, low viz does limit the type of pictures we can take. And generally, close focus work is really the way to go. I don't think you necessarily need to be limited to, to low depth of field and super macro. I do think the snooted shots can work. When I was shooting the hand fish in Tasmania, I was, um, let me get them up again, hand fish. Um, this, this dive here, I couldn't see my feet where I found this particular hand fish. Hopefully you can see that. And this was very poor visibility. I, you know, it was really probably about a meter, meter and a half visibility. But this shot isn't super close focus, but it's shot with this snooted strobe technique. So single strobe with a snoot. I've only got a beam of light just big enough to light that face of the subject. So, but generally, yes, as the visibility goes down, Andy, you definitely are limited by the types of shots you can take. Thank you, Eduardo. Thanks, Mark. Good to see you. Hey, Alex. It's a cool profile picture. Is reduced depth of field something you can do with wide angle? Generally, not too much. The problem with trying it with wide angle is you start to see the effect of depth of field on the dome port, which can make everything really blurry. I wouldn't use it as a technique with wide angle. I think it's more a case you're just going to get super close. One thing you can begin to play around with in wide angle, though, is maybe allow a little bit of longer exposure to come into the shot. And the textures that that creates, it doesn't stop the backscatter, but that extra texture in the picture helps hide it in the same way that a busy background can. So maybe playing around with long exposure camera motion can actually also help to hide the backscatter with a wide angle lens, Jessica. Thanks, Jan. Are you going to save this video somewhere? Yes, good question. So Facebook saves it automatically, but they're impossible to find after a few days. So I also upload them onto YouTube for like long term. They're not that exciting, but if you if you want to track them down on YouTube, I will get it up there so you can watch it back. I remember you used to use some inward lighting techniques we dove in the Netherlands. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, I think inward lighting isn't something to be overly scared of in low visibility because it's such a close focus technique. So, and because the light isn't actually going from the camera straight onto the subject and therefore creating backscatter that reflect back into the camera lens, because the light is around and beside the, the, the subject, the backscatter that is, is bouncing back from the strobes is bouncing away from the camera. So as long as you do inward lighting as a really close focus technique, it can work really well in, in low visibility. The moment you stop doing it as a close focus technique, then it creates um, a lot of backscatter. So it's 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 a technique that can be used in very poor visibility, but with very strict limitations on camera to subject distance. Hey, Robert, um, I'd like to understand why you want to shoot wider than you normally would. So it, it's the reason that I put that in my head. It's about forcing yourself to shoot closer. So if you know your prime subject on this particular dive is something about, say, fist size, and maybe on a tropical dive, you might shoot that with, with 100 mil on, on your Canon. This is a way to say, right, you need to come find another lens. And I realize that's a little bit harder on a Canon, but on a Nikon, we go to a, say, a 60 mil because it just forces you to be that much closer. And when you get that much closer, there's less water column, the strobes are spreading less, and therefore you, you get less backscatter. So it's just really a thinking thing. If you know you're going in for a, a lower visibility dive, it's about saying, well, uh, which macro lens should I take? I'm going to go for the wide one. Which wide angle should I take? I'm going to go for a close focus setup. It's all about encouraging yourself to get as close as possible. So I often use mini dome a lot in, in, in low visibility, again, to force myself to get nice and close to the subject. Hey, Kirsty, very topical for tomorrow's dive. Um, oh, where are you going diving tomorrow? You have to let me know. Um, I'm, I was hoping to try and get in the water in the next coming days. Thank you, Kirsty. No, everyone's in. Everyone else in the UK is reporting rain. It's it's sunny here still. Um, one of the advantages of living in the east. Thanks, Nick. I'm just going to fly through these because otherwise I've, I've got to wind this up in a sec. Thanks for the tips. Just started with underwater photography. Backscatter being challenging. Backscatter remains a challenge, however long you're doing underwater photography. 
Um, so don't worry about that. People often ask me what my job is and I say, yeah, I sit at the computer for moving back scatter from underwater pictures. And then occasionally break that up by going underwater and taking pictures. So yeah, back scatter remains part of underwater photography however long you, you do it for. Hey Chip, good to see you. Um, comment about snoots, which ones do you like? Um, because I have Retro Flash guns, I um, use the Retro Flashes, um, the Retro um, Snoot on them because it just bolts straight on, it's super easy. I think from what I hear from all my friends, the new Backscatter Mini Snoot is really good. And I tried to try it when we were in Cuba this year, but it wouldn't fire from my fiber optics. It needs quite a strong flash signal and it just wouldn't fire reliably off my camera. So I never actually got to try it. Um, but I, I do have pretty ropey fiber optics, it has to be said, on my housing. So I need to buy some better cables and a slightly better trigger probably. But I think that's really good as well. Um, those are the two that I would recommend most ab above others. Um, snoots definitely can reduce backscatter, but actually I don't, th I generally don't want this very snooted look all the time in my pictures. And what I quite like about using beam restrictors is it allows you to still have a complete, a feeling of a completely lit scene without it feeling like a, a snoot shot, even though ultimately a beam restrictor is a type of snoot. It's just not a really focused one. So it allows you to have just enough light to light your whole scene without lighting everything around it and therefore generating more backscatter. So yeah, beam restrictors, yes, all the time. Snoots, not all the time, although they will work in the same way to reduce the beam because then you end up with always a, a snooted shot. Shane, does your work advice with compact cameras? Yes, so the lighting is the same with compact cameras, but a lot of the um, lighting effects you need to have, obviously external flash guns, on strobe arms to be able to use these techniques. And as I was saying, single flash is often the way to go. So it's actually an advantage often to dive with just one flash. It gives you more space to move it around the housing and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing I would say um, with compact cameras is if you've got a built-in zoom, try not to zoom in too much because again, it will force you to get that bit closer, that bit closer. Um, and every time you can get that bit closer, your pictures will be that bit cleaner. Tomek, what kind of software or filter can you recommend for backpacking process? That's a massive subject, but Photoshop for me. I never remove any backscatter in Lightroom. I do that for two reasons. One, the tools are better in Photoshop. And two, if that way, when I go back and look through my Lightroom catalogs, I know which pictures have had manipulation and or I know that anything in Lightroom hasn't had anything removed from it. I think one of the problems if you start despotting a picture in Lightroom is you go back to it five years later and go, wow, that picture looks amazing and it's a raw file, I'm going to enter in a competition, and then you suddenly realize it had a load of backscatter in it that you, 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 you didn't, weren't allowed to remove. So I tend to don't remove backscatter in Lightroom and then remove it in Photoshop. How you do it in Photoshop, there's lots of ways that work well, and but none of them work perfectly, and it's often a blend of a few, and they're all pretty labor intensive. Right, I'm going to whiz through these last ones. Hi, Alejandro, thank you. Um, direction control. Um, Paul, I think we should have a chat about your thing. I'm not sure of the solution, to be honest, um, but I would quite like to help you um, on that. I always find some of the technical stuff you do really fascinating. Hey, Marty. Um, all good here? Yes. Um, yeah, stuck at home. Um, but other than that, very good. Um, Carries. are there specific tips, compacts with one strobe? Um, generally, make sure you've got m very good maneuverability on that strobe. So, I'm not sure where you are in the world, Kerry, at the moment, but if you're in trap, if you're in Caribbean blue water, you have a bit more flexibility. But generally, it's a case of with one strobe, strobe above the housing. The closer you are to the subject, the closer down to the housing it needs to be. The further back from the subject you are, so that strobe comes up. And then, when you want to create different effects, you can swing that strobe around to the sides and do side lighting, move around, maybe try some top lighting, and it's a really, really nice way to light. The limitation of one strobe is for close focus work, particularly close focus wide angle work. Because when a camera is really, really close to a subject, it's very hard to light a wide angle subject with a single strobe when you're really close. As soon as you're sort of this far away, it's fine to light it. But when you get really close, it's hard to get the light around the housing onto the subject. And that's the main limitation of one strobe. Hey, Mark, um, making backscatter work positively in the image, definitely with a lot of pelagic stuff. Um, pelagic jellies and things that you get a lot. It can look pretty nice, nice um, to leave it in. Also, I don't tend to be overly stressed about it. I wouldn't want all my pictures to have lots of backscatter, but I processed a lump sucker picture from Swanage this week 
And I decided just to leave all the backscatter in it. It was a very, very murky day. And I quite like the feel of it. I wouldn't want all my pictures to be like that, but there are times when it can work. Big ugly blobs, not so much. But when you've got that kind of, you know, fine sort of, you know, Star Wars background of tiny little specks of, of stars, I think it can look really good. Hey, Paul, nice to see you. Um, do you use a focus light? So generally, um, I don't use focus lights whenever I can avoid them underwater. I like my camera rig to be as small and as streamlined as possible. I like the space to move my lights around. But of course, the moment your camera can't focus, you absolutely need one. So for me, I'll make a call before going in the water. If I'm going deep, if it's dark conditions, of course, I'm going to use a focus light. If it's night, of course, I'm going to use a focus light. The focus lights built into the flash guns, they are useful for snooting, um, but actually, I don't use them so much. Um, I tend to use a fixed focus technique for aiming snoots, and it's, it's a long explanation that. But I will fix my camera's focus, I will take pictures, and then I will move the camera in and out until I've got the, the beam of the snoot exactly where I want it. In terms of aiming the snoot strobes, I don't normally have the focus lights on. They're often quite hard to see in a wide angle picture, and you do get a good feel for how the lighting is. And much better to judge your lighting based on what the picture looks like when you press the flash, and then be able to return to exactly the same composition, having made an adjustment, I think is a much better way to work than trying to work off of, of, of a beam. Andy, um... <laughs> thanks, Bunny. Hey, Duck C, small aperture, maybe Mark. Um, Alex will answer it. Okay, you guys are seeing, chatting to each other's. Okay, um, thanks, Paul. Yeah, there's Nick saying, great for eliminating backscatter. Um, hey, Neil, um, do you have examples where you work with backscatter? Yes, um, that might be quite a good place to wind up, but I shall just endeavor to find it. Um, Amph octopus, is that how you spell it? Amph. Octo. No, I've left out a P. Let's just put veined. I can never spell veined. Sorry about this. Right, just getting pictures up. And now let me just pull this up. And I'm just going to do a screen share again. Go back to my catalogue um, of pictures. And so here's a couple of pictures. So here, backscatter. I think helps this picture. It's not backscatter from the strobe, it's backscatter from the torch, but it really highlights the beam and it looks quite cool creatively. I think this is a shot, this is the shot I was thinking of when when Neil asked about using backscatter creatively. I think here this is a, a, a coconut octopus or a veined octopus in a clamshell. And I think here using a long exposure at night with plankton whizzing around, I think the backscatter here makes for quite an interesting thing. It's not really true backscatter, but I think it looks quite, quite cool. There's one, one here with a bit of dust that I'll just get, I'll get back to, to me. Right, I'm 32 minutes, so I need to start winding this up. The questions are coming in. Do you recommend using a Takina 1017 fish iron full frame? Not really. If it's the only lens you've got, fine. I wouldn't go out and buy one for full frame. There's much better options. Ultimately, Canon and Nikon both make fantastic 8-15 to 15 lenses, which are awesome lenses um, optically. The 10-17 to 17 is a bit... It's fine, but it's not a brilliant lens optically. It's an amazing focal range on a crop sensor camera, but on a full frame SLR camera, it's just a bit too compromised optically, and you've spent all that money on a super amazing camera with amazing image quality, and then you're putting, you know, an old piece of bottle on the front of it. I'm not completely, um, completely convinced about that. Hey, Saeed. Thanks, Jess. Yes, did it, 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 did it. Right. Um, enjoying the presentation. And the new one with Adam on WebPixel. Yeah, we we're going to launch that properly next week. Um, I'm going to show Tom, see Tom Potts at Babs. Ah. Oh. I didn't realize it was really a Tom Pot space. Um, I would go to Wembury. I think Wembury, that big rock that Paul Naylor shoots in Wembury, that's the that's the place for Tom Potts in the southwest. Um, South Florida. Uh, hey, Henry. Right, I'm just going to whiz through. I'm going to skip through any which aren't questions now. Um, I'm not sure I want to encourage Laurie Campbell to, to shoot underwater. We don't need that competition, British underwater photographers. Um, Anyone who needs any equipment, Alex Alex T is, is ready for the ready for that. Um, oh, he's talking about the backscatter from mini flash, which everyone tells me is great, and I wasn't able to try it yet, but I'm sure I will be able to. Um, two strobes definitely for close focus, wide angle. 
um, simply because when you're really close to a subject, you can't light it well with one strobe, right? Do you use a focus light? Any tips for minimizing backscatter when you use these? Okay, we've had that one. Um, hey, Mero, good to see you here. Yep, yeah, well, that's a really good point, actually, is bits in the water can be a really, really, really interesting part of the, the, the story. I have a basking shark, which you can only just see through the plankton. I'm not going to waste time putting it up now. You can dig it out if you want to. Um, no problem. Oh, so that's probably a reasonable place to, to wind up. There are a few more comments, and I'm sorry I'm not going to get to them all, but I need to wind up. Um, I will come back and do another one next week. One of the reasons also for doing two this week was it probably be the tail end of next week where I've got some time to do another one of these. But I really enjoy doing them. They don't take any preparation. I just, just literally jump online and go. So thank you all for watching. Thank you for commenting so much and questions. That's what makes, I think, these really special. And see you all again. Bye.